Green's friends. My call sign is Adul, commander of the Terra unit. My call of Alpov, commander of the aerial reconnaissance unit. His drones are the eyes of the artillery, and these eyes burn the enemy's equipment, and they minus the rashists in the dugouts. Apparently, we offended some D colonel. Direct hit in Spa Paladin. He went to war in 2014 and was among those who started aerial reconnaissance in the Azov regiment. During the Great War, Abdullah and his comrades had already completed the Kyiv and Kherson campaigns, and now they are holding the defense of Bakhmut. So the secrets of Ukrainian air reconnaissance and maneuvers in the air. These are warriors. Let's go. Friends, one more minute of your attention. My call sign is Abdullah. I am the commander of the Terra unit. Terra fights under Bakhmut. Difficult. But with your help, we can do it. I wanted to thank all those who support us. And for those who want to do it, the link to the fundraising is in the video description. We also have a patron. Join in. This fundraising is for drones. There is not such thing as many drones. Victory will be ours. Glory to Ukraine. My call, thank you for communicating with journalists. And through us you communicate with Ukrainians. You talk about what is happening at the front. And of course, you tell all about aerial reconnaissance. I want to talk to you about it today. And I want to start this conversation with a theme. How air reconnaissance has evolved during these eight, we can say nine years. How did it all start in 2014? It is interesting that I have something to tell about air reconnaissance in 2014 to 2015. In those years, I was first in the battalion and then in the Azov regiment. There was aerial reconnaissance in Azov. It was something rare then. Something that no one else had. But, let's say those who had a brave mind already began to say that it would be good to fly on such a vehicle. Because then there was no combat aviation, and therefore no reconnaissance aircraft either. Everyone thought about it, and in Azov we just did it. And we did the following. We went to Kiev, as I remember now, on the Karkovska metro station. By the way, I lived there in the first years of my school life. And in one of the office premises, there was an office of a young but promising company who produced such a wing. Now everyone knows it very well, it's Fury. We found them, we got to know them, and we bought the first Fury complex in Azov, as I remember now. And we started air reconnaissance in Azov. To be honest, we did not have such a result as it is now. Because we were confined to artillery complexes, but, you know, it was the first step. And the most interesting thing is that the person, my friend, who was then appointed to the position of head of air reconnaissance in Azov, he and I met in this war because I was a foot scout at the time. We were engaged in classic military intelligence. I met this guy in this war, and he taught me and my comrades already in this company to control unmanned aerial vehicles. And then how exactly did this story develop? When did you first start using Fury or any other drones in 2014 or 2015? Uh, we started using it in 2015. Mostly it was intelligence and additional intelligence in order to obtain information about the enemy's battle formations, in order to obtain information, say, for yourself about your positions, for their improvement. I will tell you honestly, I don't remember such results. Maybe it was happening, but I did not know about it. Because within in 2015, I went home to my civilian life. And maybe there were some events there, but they were insignificant. 
But compared to what happens during this campaign, as much as everything is tied to intelligence on the adjustment of fire from the air, so much everything depends on it. Then, you know, that was the beginning. And we were rather interested in this as a promising direction. It was only the Ukrainian side interested. Did the Russian side and the separatists from the so-called upper end begin to work in this direction? Uh, the Russian side even then possessed a certain number of unmanned systems. They, let's say, like the army, which was still preparing for the invasion, were more prepared, unlike us. And they already had eagles then. And even then they worked with them, adjusted the fire. But you know, even at the beginning of this campaign, Russians, they really like to fight with their instructions. Therefore, they used it little. About artillery, when was the Shirokin campaign? I felt that the artillery worked more with artillery maneuvers. That they do not adjust each shot, but nail to a certain zone. Then they shift the fire to obtain certain effects. They already had it. We only thought about it then. Can we now say that it was drones that began to change the course of this war, in particular, civilians? Certainly, it is so. I have this opinion that the West gave us weapons. But, in general, the entire history of making humanity in terms of the evolution of military thought, trying to figure out how to make this or that weapon to hit the target, this is very important for the military, because ever since it was invented, the question was how to hit someone with it. That is the use of drones, let's say, saves personnel. If compared with the usual intelligence, which was in the same year, 2014. Yeah, you know, it was a lot more extreme. In 2014 to 2015, we entered the gray area. We reached enemy positions. And in order to understand what was happening there in general, it was necessary to go there. These are constant risks associated with mining. These are constant risks associated with fire contact. It was quite an extreme type of activity. And in fact, why in all countries of the world are higher requirements for foot reconnaissance, for classic army reconnaissance, both in shooting accuracy and in physical form, in order to give these people at least some chance of survival. When they encounter enemy forces superior to them, to somehow survive and complete a combat mission. Now, yes, it saves a lot of human resources, first of all, and this greatly increases the component with which we hold on, and with the help of which we dominate certain areas of the front. It is, it is artillery. You see, our gunners are not bad. The West gives us artillery complexes. Our boys master them quite quickly. And the question of shooting accuracy arises. There is one more nuance. Drones, especially in their current form. These are mostly, at least we use, civilian drones. This is something we cannot improve. Example, self-propelled artillery installation M109. We can't do anything with any money. Whether I have a million, two million, ten million dollars, I can't buy another set like this. I can't influence the improvement of its combat functions in any way. I can't buy shells for it, but I can buy a small appliance for twenty-five hundred dollars which will make these projectiles hit, that is, it will give meaning to all this action. This is the paradox of drones, and especially civilian drones, because it would seem like a small component, cheap in relation to the price of artillery complexes and shells for them. It can increase their effectiveness. I do not even know. This is some discrete mathematics. It's like one and zero. Hit or miss. Make them hit.
By the way, I read the reviews of experts specifically about your unit, and they write that from those videos that you publish. It can be concluded that you are using a new tactic, and you have such a characteristic handwriting. Can you talk about certain details of your innovations and why people talk about your handwriting? <coughs> well, let me tell you what I can. Again, one of the elements of our handwriting. Despite the fact that we publish certain video materials, but we always do a very thorough intelligence analysis, there is such a thing as scouting video analysis. When a scout, an analyst tries to get useful information from the video, yes, we conduct an analysis for each video so that the enemy does not perceive this information. Well, now I'll tell you everything I can, but so that the enemy does not receive useful information. Well, first of all, it is high initiative and responsibility of calculations. This is what we promote, and apparently this is the basis on which the effectiveness of our work and the work of other teams is based in the WAV who is engaged in adjusting or dropping supplies, or who is simply engaged in intelligence, additional intelligence, who is successful. I will say right away that powerful and good teachers are behind any success. We were trained by the 28th Brigade. There is such a deputy chief of artillery with the Kalzian surgeon, Akamu. At the beginning of this campaign, we met with him. We got to know each other. And he taught us exactly those approaches that provide good result. This is initiative. This is the responsibility of the adjuster. The point is, the adjuster and scout, he is not just there to fly, and he is directly responsible for the final result. I mean, for the injury of the enemy. It's very important. It's like a business approach. Sometimes it's not so important what you do as it is what you get in the end. This is probably the main whale on which all our results stand. And in general, this is, let's say, the basis of the work style. It's initiative and responsibility. What about tactics and tricks? I will tell you about something that has not been a secret for a long time. Once upon a time, at the very beginning in the Kursan region, we invented, figuratively speaking, so it's like reinventing the wheel. We invented the carousel drone operation method. This is when one drone was hanging in the air. The second took off and took up a position overlooking the target. Only after that, drone number one landed. This allowed us to buy a little more time for the artillery. We did this not pause pros to replace the battery. And this helped the gunners to fire several more shells until the enemy opened fire in return. And to make counter battery struggle not to begin. Everyone liked it very much. That increased security. That increased productivity. Well, for example, during certain assault operations, we gave an overview for making management decisions from the angle of the 90 degrees in position. We placed our calculations so that the battlefield was open from two directions at an angle of 90 degrees. I mean, those objects that could be hidden for one observer were open to another and vice versa. In general, I want to say that everything here is somehow similar to ordinary civilian life. If you are responsible men or responsible woman, if you are result-oriented, if you really believe that your work contributes to victory, if you do not think, as some do, that someone, I will say such a term, that someone from the left wing or from the right wing will tighten, and we have to sit down here quietly. No, it is we who are pulling here. There is no one else. And you should always think that everything depends on you. Either victory or defeat. Take responsibility. And then it starts to come out. 
Now, when they talk about aerial reconnaissance, it is the digitalization of the army. If, of course, I can say so, is it possible to study aerial reconnaissance in the ranks of the EFU? Need to join units like yours, and you can already teach and transfer your experience. There are different options. It is necessary, once again, to share the skills of an aerial scout on technical skills, management skills. This is something that can be learned, in fact, with modern civilian drones, even at home, no matter where. Almost anyone can teach you to pilot. There is a very large number of courses. We recently sent 21 people to the Dnipro for courses. There are good courses there. The guys teach the basics of piloting G drones. Mavic Matrix. We sent them to a Mavic 3 course, basic course. They will be taught there, I think, also the basis of the use of nettle. Binding to the area. This is the civil component of this case. The reason so many people think that if you know how to fly a drone, then in principle, you are also a scout. You go to the front and start benefiting immediately without leaving the cash register. And the second component is the military component, because that is what is written in the Constitution. And so it actually is. Everyone who is here, in the ranks of the AFU, the National Guard, or even just came as a volunteer. First of all, he is a soldier. First of all, he is a fighter. And this person must have a base of military tactics. Such components as movement on foot, movement by car, unfolding and collapsing, handling artillery, shelling. This is a little more difficult to learn. Yes, this experience can be adopted. Recently, we have only been doing that, trying to scale our experience, so we could somehow to pass it on to other groups. We do it very simply. We take the boys with us. We take them on combat missions. All our training takes place only on combat missions. Unfortunately, there is no time to drive anyone to the landfill or anywhere else. Therefore, yes, there is something that can be learned in the courses there are such courses in the ranks of AFU now. It is very fashionable now. There are also private courses. There are private courses integrated into the armed forces. You pass them, but there is a certification. It will be suitable for military units. There are exclusively military units engaged in training, where you can get military counting specialty. In your military ticket, it will be written that you are an air scout or scout. So yes, there are many possibilities, but you can get real experience only in interaction with groups which are already working directly on the battlefield. You mentioned private courses, even within AFU. It is free. Do you have to pay for it? You know, I joke that in this life you have to pay for everything. If you don't pay for something and it's free for you, it does not mean that someone else is not paying for it, or the form of payment is not classic. In the armed forces, the price is probably the service in these armed forces. Of course, the armed forces treat people, and this is normal and correct. First of all, as a resource, if we talk about military management, of course, if you are completing some courses at if you, the if you is counting on you on the battlefield, and that's absolutely normal. As I said, there are civilian courses integrated into the armed forces. For example, you come to study, the state pays for it and prepares you. Of course, there they recommend you to go and defend Ukraine. In fact, it is a very good decision to do so. We, our team, have never once regretted that we did it on the 24th of February. And there they can teach you. Well, these are, you know, semi-preparatory stages for people to do this as a military specialty. 
Uh, Even last year, before the new year, we talked about the problem of importing civilian drones because they were dual-purpose goods then. Now this problem no longer exists. Is it still there? And drones are not so easy to import. You know the main problem in the import of drones. In the first phase of the war, it was difficult to get drones at good price. Yes, it was like that. The path my team took. First, we received a certain number of drones from volunteers we knew. Then, we took our own resource and started purchasing. We went online, searched, and bought. Well, you do understand that those prices that you find quickly and those offers that have the option of fast delivery, as a rule, they are not very optimal financially. <coughs> Sorry, I have a bit of a cold. Uh. Yes, at first it was difficult to buy drones at a good price or in large quantities. It was difficult to buy certain models, for example, the same Matrix 30. It was actually produced by G during the war. Before that, everyone flew either the Mavic 3 or the Matrix 300. As I remember now, I was advised by Mr. Duprikin from 131 serve a separate reconnaissance battalion. He said, guys, Matrix 300 is very expensive. Its total cost, together with the required number of batteries for operation, exceeds $30,000. Try Matrix 30. We ordered it, started working. I would not say that we have ever had problems with it. But, let's say, it is probably because we were very proactive. Always looking for a way. In general, war opens up a lot of opportunities for those who want to achieve some results. Results that is meant in the defense of the country. And whoever wants, he will always find a place to buy and get. We never had any problems. I follow the current legislation regarding the import of drones. There have been some improvements, really, and that will probably lead to more of these drones available to people without the experience of buying them. I already have a whole pool of people who can conduct them for me. Someone make it this way, someone that way, someone other way. Of course, no one violates the law. But now it will be easier for people who do not have experience in procurement. Do you buy everything with the funds of the unit, with the donations you fundraising from Ukrainians? Do you also have any government assistance? Yes. Probably two months ago, I told you about how we do everything ourselves and no one helps. At first, it was really like that. I will repeat again, we started this path by that at first, we were given several drones by volunteers we knew. And then we bought at our own expense, as long as we could afford the necessary expenses. There is, fortunately or unfortunately, not so many of us. Then our friends joined us. I have many acquaintances who realized themselves in the business. These people, as a rule, have an awareness of what is happening and financial resources. Our friends began to finance us. We had a direct conversation. I remember the harsh time when we went from Kyiv to Kherson. If Kyiv is still my hometown, I have been to Kherson several times in my life, and all these news about the fact that Kherson will be hell right now. I called my friends and said, friends, do you generally support Ukraine or not? They said, we support. 
I said, well, then you have two options to stay with honor. You either take things and go to us, and you directly protect it here, or you provide us with everything necessary for this protection. And in fact, you are also standing next to us, but with a slightly different tool. Financial. We buy drones, bulletproof vests, and cars for those money. Everything we need. This was the second stage of this case. And then donations started, but from the other people, who I don't know, but I'm very grateful, actually, to everyone who helps. They started donating and our capabilities increased more. I will return a little to the previous question about tactical nuances. For example, we were able to afford double or even triple duplication of critical nodes. Imagine a combat mission. The drone is lost, for example, it is crushed by electronic warfare. And we go home. At the end of the operation, let the infantry be without information support. Let the artillery shoot by itself. No, we will get the next drones. And they beat him down. Then we get the third one. This is normal practice for double or triple duplication. And when more people started to support us, because after all, there can't be a million friends. They are also exhausted financially over time. War is not cheap. So we could afford more. If you count the statistics, what are the statistics of drones losses in one month? Oh, this is such a delicate question. My statistics of lost drones in four months of the Kherson campaign, where we really had results, our main ones, where we have had successful experience, and where we met, I will repeat again, apparently I have never will get tired to repeat, who taught us and introduced us to this job specification. Odysseus, such a colonel of a certain kind of army, 131 Sir Diprikin and 28 Brigade Surgeon Akamu. We had no losses of drones at all. You know it was our great pride. What I wanted to tell you about. We met with people and asked them how many Mavic drones have they lost. They said, well, this is already the fourth. I say, and we have none. And what is the reason? They said, well, they are being knocked down. Electronic warfare is pressing. They are falling. I said, understood. And we did not lose a single one. Despite the fact that we have battles every day and the load on the equipment is significant. And for a long time, we really were a team that had nothing to lose. Then we lost. Over the next month, we lost in the Kherson region. We lost several Mavic drones, but I blame it on the fact that we are already became a little too self-confident. You know, at first you watched introduce a bunch of measures and a bunch of rules in order not to lose them. And by observing all these measures, you do not lose. Then you often get the impression that you don't lose because you're just cool. Fate punished us, and we lost our first Mavic in the Kherson region. It was a great morning. We analyzed right there. How did this happen? Shortly, in Kherson, we did not lose at all. Then we went to the Zaporizhzhia direction. And we were there for 10 days. For 10 days we were with the infantry in the trenches, working together with them. Mavic 3 spots the target, then takes off the 30 matrix to adjust and injure. We lived in trenches. Of course, trench life imposes certain restrictions, gets tired over time. And if I'm not mistaken, on day 7 or 8, we lost matrix 30. We lost it quite interestingly. Again, it was not our pilot's fault. It's just that the enemy used an electronic warfare device that had not been encountered before. And that was our price for the experience. And then we lost our matrix for the first time. But you understand that six or seven months have already passed since the beginning of the war, and there were no losses. 
And then we arrived together with the 3rd Assault Brigade, which already has the Azov Tactical Group. As part of it, they came to Bakhmut. And here I will tell you honestly, then it began. Here it became clear to us that the reason why we do not lose it's just healthy decisions, not our general coolness, even if sometimes we wanted to think so. Then it was too late. Then Electronic Warfare Crush Matrix 300. A cunning Electronic Warfare device forced our Matrix 30 to fly into the wall at full speed. There was connection failing with Mavic drones. This is absolutely normal practice, even when the pilot is doing everything right. Follows all combat chats, orients himself in the production. That is, he is not suffocated there by our electron warfare. He understands what he is doing and still lost. I mean, the losses due to drones are huge. You asked how many drones a month? I know some units. It's not my unit. But those units had losses more than 15 Mavic drones per day. And the jokes were already starting. Yes, gentlemen, today those guys lost 15, those 10. Those who lost 10 say, well, we have five more. Tomorrow will be enough for half a day. So it turns out, if at the beginning, during the Kursen campaign, there were lost in drones either by accident or through electronic warfare, or, as you say, because of self-confidence. And now, in the direction of Bakhmut, the Russians are using, as you say, some cunning systems that intercepting drones. Do you understand what this system is? So I understand. I don't know exactly what kind of system it is, but I understand the principles of their work, and we quite successfully accumulate experience and we are quite successfully implementing countermeasures against their devices. Their devices oppose us, and we oppose their devices. Uh, we are countering quite effectively, I would say so. There is a positive accumulation of experience. We share this experience as much as we can. I recently asked my comrades. We have written several instructions for counteracting those devices. First, we realized how it works. They described how it works and a set of countermeasures but we distribute this information within the community as much as we can. But again, what I want to focus on. When we first arrived here, we and the unit began to lose. But at the moment, these losses are much smaller. We lose much less in one week. Because we have adapted. Can I say that the enemy has found some key to us, and now we will always lose drones, and we will not do anything about it? No, I will not say that. The situation is stabilized. We see them. We have built methodical instructions on how to act so as not to lose drones, and at the same time perform a combat mission. Well, everything is more or less normal, and their devices, they try to do everything. They have some of them standing there, either high-tech or made in the garage stuff. Sometimes it's hard for me to say. Some antennas that respond to approaching drones include jammers. Again, military devices of jamming are more professional. They can disorient the drone in spaces or even make it move in any direction. It's just dumb jamming of the channel or of controlling or video communication. Their success became much more calm than it was at the beginning of the battle for Bakhmut. If you compare the cost of the drone with other equipment used by if you, the cost of the drone is not so great. It is not millions of dollars. At the same time, these drones destroy enemy Russian equipment. How much valuable equipment did Terra Division manage to destroy? What valuable equipment?
Well, one that really pleased me. We celebrated very much and rejoiced. And I still show everyone the photos. Once in the Kherson direction, specialists from me arrived. Perhaps it is already possible to talk about it, because it is in the distant past. Specialists arrived and began to implement on the Prevdino line. Opposite us, they started implementing a system of working with a drone. Because we were already actively working with the drone, we had already established some kind of system. The 31st Orb has already successfully destroyed their artillery systems and equipment. Ni arrived, brought their G drones and began to adjust the system. We stood against paratroopers. They were opposite us. Aidable equipment arrived. Apps has arrived. Painted in camouflage for the region and season. Well, you know, that's pretty rare. Can you imagine constantly repainting the technique? There are whole huge tables. Under what lane, territory, under what climate, how should it all be painted? They have to be repainted almost five times a year. Here comes such equipment without V marks. They stand near the cabinier, where the paratroopers, armed P arsenal carriers, is already standing. And we get shot, and so on the fourth direct hit from the spot paladin 155 caliber. This armed P arsenal carriers simply converts from a technique to a funnel. Learning detonates, and after it happens, we must have offended someone with such behavior. And then five days, probably, such more aggressive, more brutal work of their MERS systems on infantry positions, from which an adjustment can potentially be made. Apparently, we offended some D colonel. Maybe someone important died there, some relative of his. And they kept us in such severe terror for five days. They were beating on our positions. It was hard enough. Well, it was a price of it. I also remember that we destroyed MST a B. This is a Russian howitzer. Their basic howitzer 152 caliber. So interestingly, it was destroyed. This is also a whole story. We are shooting at it. And such a viewing angle, it seems as if we are hitting. But how to extend to shift to the north or to the south is a little unclear, because the viewing angle it is quite far away. And here the artillery officer of the 28th Brigade enters combat time. And in his artillery language he says, Guys, closer to five. He says it, and we have a direct hit. This howitzer, or rather the ammunition near it, begins to burn and detonate. And at the end, detonate the ammunition right in the barrel. A bowl of smoke comes out of the barrel as if it is shooting, but it does not shoot. It was also a very good injure. And at the very beginning of our military, I would not call it a career, probably military path. When we arrived in the Kherson region, we were a reconnaissance platoon. And when we scouted positions for takeoff positions for work, so we went down together with the javelin operators, led them into position and banged the tank. He received injure on board. After that, it did not drive anymore. Well, with the help of drones, it was already a purely infantry work. And that's what we've been doing since the very beginning. That's why I calculated in my mind, I could be wrong, but in principle, if there will ever be free time, then you can review it. Because we have everything recorded, all injuries. We destroyed eight units of MSTB howitzers, confirmed injuries. Destroyed two armored fighting vehicles. Tank. Two syllables of squadron me. Not as big as the Heimer's crush, but it's also nice. How many infantry positions did we destroy? It's even hard for me to say we did not count on that. 
But I want to say that there are people who work much more efficiently. Again, 131, Battalion, my favorite. There Mr. Deprikin recently destroyed Thor, an autonomous air defense system. He destroyed Thor Arctic, which is designed for use in very difficult conditions. There are only 11 or 12 of them in Russia. Well, he destroyed minus one. In general, they destroy very cool and such rare equipment there. They have a safari there, and they have very significant results. This is how equipment that has no analogs is destroyed. Well, analogs, there is no and probably will not be any more because it burned down. Let's put it this way, our main result is systematicity. It's one thing to destroy something. And this is also, of course, very beautiful. If you were working and you managed to destroy something interesting once, but the main result of me and my team is systematic work. And by the way, returning to tactics, again, this is systemic work. We fight as we go to the factory. I never went to the factory, but somehow I imagine it like that. That is, it is not that you went and shot a little with artillery crumbs explored. You feel a little tired. You will go home and rest. It is such a difficult job every day, from day to day. Night departures for the whole night, day departures for the whole day. And probably, if you ask me what the most important injury was, I would say that it is not so important. What we injured, but what is important is how systematic it was. Actually, why did the Russians pack their things and moved to the left side of the Dnieper? They left their positions. Someone will say that this is a cunning, well-calibrated plan of Putin, but this is pure nonsense. They could not stand the pressure, because when you lose artillery every day, you have nothing to cover the infantry because you lost the artillery. When the artillery rolls out these infantry positions every day, very accurate fire. When every infantryman knows he can't hide, knows that we see everything, know everything. When even Miss who stopped by for the purpose of integrating some kind of combat system, just with this component of drones, they arrived and good morning, lose equipment, personnel. Of course, there is a motivation to pack up and retreat. By the way, there are not only civilian drones, but also military drones. Two Lelika Shark. Does your unit use them or do you not need them? Well, first of all, let me explain to you right away that there are different classes of drones. That is, there are quadcopters. Let's draw such a demarcation line between quadcopters and wings. Quadcopters are four screws, vertical takeoff, and the ability to hover on a point, and as a rule, powerful optics. At least G does. And wings are such planes that fly at a distance. At higher altitudes, for longer distances. As a rule, they cost more. As a rule, they have a more complex deployment. That is, a quadcopter. It was lifted on the arm and it flew. I'm looking to see if there's a quadcopter somewhere near me. I'd show you. Well, and the wing, although it is not a full fledged one, it is an airplane. That is, it needs an initial speed to start. And the bigger this plane is, the more difficult it is to transport it. All those devices which you said that wings... My unit is more specialized in mobile deployment at work from the front lines. Because no one from the front line works with wings, of course. The idea is that you raise it somewhere from the rear or around the rear. It flies up to 30 kilometers. Some complexes fly even 60. Well, technically, 60 and 100 can fly by. They look for targets there, provide additional intelligence. 
Some, including the ones you mentioned, are equipped with real-time VO transmission. They adjust the fire. We practice a more infantry version of work. Our advantages are precisely in rapid deployment, greater mobility, greater adaptability. Again, I will say a little about the loss of drones. You asked how much is lost. I was telling you about quadcopters. This is such an operational level. But we also lose our wings here. And I would say that at least those ideas that I had about the implementation of tandem work in a complex of wings and quadcopters, they are unsuccessful so far. You know, the more complex the technique, the more difficult it is to work with it. Before the trip to Bakhmut, before we received the combat order to advance urgently. You know, in the armed forces, everyone likes things to be very urgent. They give combat orders and already today you pack your things. You should be in position already tomorrow. I don't know why that is. I hope this makes some sense. Probably if we had stayed in the place of permanent deployment for another week, we would have received the Mara 2 wing. It's a full flight, but it's at least in the class you're asking about. We wanted to develop, we wanted to create a separate group that would deal with additional primary intelligence, additional reconnaissance of targets on the wings. But, unfortunately, Bakhmut put an end to that. Apparently, not a dot, but a comet in this path of evolution. And we are now doing what we are good at, which is quadcopters, so that there was a maximum result here and now. Shortly. Yes, we plan to switch to wings as well. We start with Mara. It is simpler and cheaper. Then I think we will switch to Lelka or Fury. At the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned that there is a carousel of drones. Are the Russians somehow trying to copy your tactics and your maneuvers? Definitely trying. You can never underestimate the enemy. Russians, of course, fighting not adaptive, but something. They try to do, you can't underestimate them either. Trying to copy. But it is important to understand one such point. In the world of innovation, both in business and in civil life, and in military life, the one who implements innovations receives significant advantages and significant effects. The one who first invented the microprocessor, the one who first came up with some newer communication system, the one who first invented the iPhone, he receives extra profits and extra results from this. Then, of course, everyone understands that they need to do something similar. They copy imitate. But, as a rule, it does not lead to any super results. Our drone tactics have resulted in much smaller forces, much smaller resources. We were able to contain, as they say, the second army of the world. Many say this with irony. I don't know which ruler measures all armies which of them is the first, which is the second. But, in fact, I would never underestimate it. the achievement that we, all Ukrainians, have, and those who help of us, and the power that we restrain. And this is the over-assault. The over-assault is that in the Kherson region, when the enemy had a total advantage in artillery complexes, when they could set up six howitzers on one firing position, and drive three self-propelled guns just because they could. When they could iron us day and night, they did not need this adjustment. They thought so because they could release a huge amount of ammunition and only the very first Spa Paladin complexes and M777 howitzers came to us. And there was not much ammunition. The total was not enough. 
but we were able to methodically destroy all their barrel artillery which they brought here. That was the super effect, that was the super result that we got thanks to being the first. And what they imitate, let them try. Maybe the next step has been taken and they will imitate our yesterday. You took part in the Kyiv campaign and the Kherson campaign. These are different geographies. Roughly speaking, Kyiv region is forests and Kherson region is fields. Where is it easier and better for an aerial scout to work? Uh, it is definitely Kherson. In general, when I think of Kherson, I have very warm memories. These are nice people we met who taught us how to work which showed the right direction, what should be done. They show the result on their example. This is the 28th, my favorite brigade. By the way, they are standing next to us even now. You can imagine how fate does not separate us. Although I myself am currently in the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade in the Azov Tactical Group, but they are always around. And the 131st Brigade, a separate reconnaissance battalion. A pile of destroyed equipment. Summer, again you have to understand that it was summer. Perhaps, I have such pleasant memories, because fighting in the summer is still much easier than surviving in the winter. Kyiv campaign, it's winter. Now it's winter. The Kherson campaign was spring and summer. A huge amount of stuffed equipment. Yes, the fields are purely places for artillery duels. We are unmanned reconnaissance complexes. This is such a part of artillery complexes, integral. And, of course, I liked it better in person. I'll tell you honestly. But if you now compare Bakhmut and the conditions in which you have to fight, what can you say to compare with Kherson and with Kyiv region? Because it's also winter. Harder, much harder. Why is it harder? I give myself the following answer to this question. So, everything that was strand so and the person front was quite large. If you even look at the map, this is a long front. And the means that there were also accordingly strand so and and here everything seems to be as it was supposed to be, as a black hole before collapse. Like everything shrunk to one point. They pulled all the technique here. If there, when there was the Kherson part of the campaign, everyone discussed where is it hotter? Is it hotter in person or Kharkiv at last? Someone said, but you do not know all what is happening in the Donetsk direction. What battles are there? Now it is obvious to everyone that the hottest spot is Ukrainian, Russian-Ukrainian war, so perhaps it is more correct to say it is Bakhmut. And if we develop an opinion, then the hottest point in the world. I don't know how much news I read, maybe there is something somewhere, but at least I don't know about it. Of course, much harder. First, there is the relief. That it is, after all, this is not a mirror of the Kherson region, not a smooth field. There was also some terrain, but it cannot be compared. Here is the relief and my subjective impression that Donbas is more densely populated. There are more all kinds of small towns and small villages here. Accordingly, the enemy that is there, that is fixed there, this winter, subjectively, it seems to me that this winter is colder than the last. Although I did not check, I did not see what the indicators were there. And in general, the war is developing. At that time, it was the Russians who tried to enter Kyiv as if on a white horse in the form of tank columns. They took with them the Russian guard with batons and plastic shields, among other. And now they are Wagner's mercenaries. I heard it's not just Wagner's mercenaries here. They are simply famous, so everyone talks about them a lot. 
that there are several groups of mercenaries here. Pet Shoig has some kind of military office. He also drove them here. These are regular troops, and this is Russia's war by military methods. Because what happened in Kiev? You remember, it really was such an iron white horse. They drove, 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 drove. Everyone were not happy to see them here. It was destroyed here. And they are like this. Well, we thought that the Ukrainians would tremble and simply see such a quantity of equipment and run away. But they did not run. Well, that's it. Let's go back. Let's try number two. Here they are already fighting with military methods. They are entrenched here. They have better artillery, better intelligence. Then they no longer break on their favorite axis. That's why it's harder here. Okay, let's talk about you. You joined the auto back in 2014. What did you do then and why did you decide to go and defend Ukraine? Uh, what did I do? I graduated from the university, completed the master's degree in Shevchenko University, the Faculty of Economics. I defended my diploma. It was the last phase. Before that, we took an active part in what was happening on the Maidan. By the way, it is an interesting fact that the same people with whom I was on the Maidan are the same people who are now sitting behind the wall. They drink coffee, discuss something and laugh. This is such an interesting fact. So we were on the Maidan, and this is where the auto begins. Wasn't it then? Was it? I honestly don't remember anymore. All this, in fact, is one big war, just different episodes. The war with Russia begins, and one of my friends is going to Azov. He said, guys, we have to protect this country. At that time, I had the idea that some people in Donetsk decided to destroy my country. They have their own special point of view that someone will separate our country. They gather there, took automatic weapons in their hands, and want something. And if we are not able to overcome it, and there were still no tanks, no aircraft, no artillery, nothing. If we are not able to overcome someone who wants to harm us, if we won Maidan, Yanukovych run away, if we are not able now to go there and there to explain to people that this is Ukraine and that they should probably pack things together with Viktor Fedorovich and go somewhere to the Krasnodar territory. Did he go there? In general, why all this effort? I remember like now, I defended my diploma. It was necessary to rent or buy a master's robe and such a funny hat and go to the final post-graduation party with fellow students. My friend and I got on the train and went to the famous city of Berdyansk. Azov had base there. Such an interesting episode that when I returned to the first rotation, I did not take the diploma, the paper itself. And my father said to me, son, go get a diploma, you will need it in life. I went to pick it up. In the dean's office, they started grumbling at me that I was an ungrateful student for not coming to graduation. This is generally very bad behavior and Shevchenko graduates do not behave like this. I said, well, yes, because I went to war. And they say, how war? Shortly, they dragged me to the dean by the hand. He told me what a great guy I am, how is the right thing to do we do, and so on. Such a funny situation. The motivation was to defend country. The motivation was to continue what was started on the Maidan. And I will tell you a little more. I was still very small, I don't remember how old I was, my father was watching television. They said there was a war in some country and refugees were running from there. Well, there they showing grandfathers, women with children and showing young guys. And I said, Dad, what is going on? He said, there is a war in the country and they are migrating. They are leaving this country because it has become bad there. I said, okay, I understand why grandfathers, women and children go. I understand that. 
Why are these young men running away? My father says to me, why do these young men run away? I don't even know my son. I probably remembered it in 2014. And we went to protect the country from collapse. By the way, I read one of your interviews somewhere. You talked there about the fact that you used to arrange nightly duels. Why did you choose this topic? And why exactly was the nightly theme closer to you than, for example, the image of a Cossack with a saber? Well, these are slightly different periods of history, slightly different centuries. Kazakhs, why are they not close to me? Close. I did not really organize it, I took part in it. Again with the same people I am with now. In the terror format we fight against Russia. We participated in medieval battles with the same people. This is such a big hobby. There are different things. There are also full contact fights, real battles in armor 100 on 100. This is probably an attempt to feel what people felt in those periods. With bruises, fractures, everything. There were also international battles. There were competitions like a battle of nations. We were in the national team. I was there for several years. Some of my friends longer. Including there, we fought against Russia. Sometimes we won. So you have already defeated Russia once? Yes, we defeated Russia. And it's really, as I say, that for us all that's going on right now is that... What happened in 2014? When was the low base? Russia introduced regular troops. Army persevered. When Russia now has an incredibly large amount of equipment and infantry. And we persevere. Well, for a second, how many in Ukraine now? 30 million, perhaps, population now? And in Russia, there are 160 million. Imagine, just compare these scales. And Russia is oil material country. So it can mobilize financial resources very quickly. And you don't even need to produce anything. You just need gas to pour out of the ground under natural pressure. And this gas was sold through the pipe to someone there. And they will have money for everything. Unfortunately, things are not so simple here. And we had the same thing when we were in the national team of Ukraine and fought in competitions against the Russians. We have such a format of battles 21 on 21, so we probably chose the best from one and a half squads. We had 30 of the best people in all of Ukraine, those who fought well. The Russians conducted several stages of selection. They chose the best of the best, probably from 10 teams, if not more. And as the commander of our national team once said, Gentlemen, the Russian national team, the Russian format 21, probably weighs about a ton or one and a half more than ours, physically. That is, they could choose bigger people, there are no weight categories. By the way, that's why weight is decisive there, as in any contact battles. But we beat them, despite all that. And it seemed that it was impossible, but we just did it. And there was such a story. The Russians, as always, shouted that it was not fair. They are still shouting that it is not fair, because the West helps us. And what is it, anyway? And then there was such a joke. They started analyzing some videos, and we were accused of the fact that we did not have 21 fighters, but 22 that the Ukrainians were cheating. Then someone started making caricatures, memes. They put the face of Jesus on one of the helmets and said that it was Jesus who came out on the 22nd to support us. <laughs> Such a story. Therefore, in fact, Cossacks are cool and the Middle Ages are too. It's just different periods. By the way, we also had knights. If we mention Daniel Halitsky, there are archaeological finds on our territory, and there are references in historical documents that we also had full plate armor here. And the fact that we had our own knighthood here, therefore, it is an absolutely patriotic hobby. Of course, 
By the way, I think that our knights are still the same. It's just that the armor has become more convenient, changed, and is not as heavy as it was. Well, you see, there is a line in this. In general, every story of every person has a certain line. There is some sequence. So this is our sequence. It's our consistency that we've always been more. I will not talk about myself, I'll talk about my friends. My friends were always braver. They had, let's say, masculine qualities to compete in many sports. Including in these medieval battles. And probably all of us were drawn there because we wanted to test ourselves. That's people, especially when they grow up. When teenagers become men, there is such a desire to test themselves. What are you capable of? Someone is engaged in martial arts. Someone goes to the extreme. That's what we had. Such an intersection. And since we have a very intelligent company, we all probably have two higher educations, and some have three higher educations. We chose it because it mixes history and travel. Because there are many festivals abroad. Примішуються мандрівки, тому що теж багато фестивалів за кордоном. In France, in Italy, in Germany, medieval castles. I visited many armor museums. They studied how it was all arranged. This is also the medieval mechanics of these armors. We made these armors for ourselves, and then we competed in them. Well, of course, the war came and the knightly weapons in our hands changed. Well, we grew up, of course. Второручні мечі в наших руках змінилися, ну і ми виросли, звичайно, змінилися на... It changed to automatic machines, remote controls for drones, walkie-talkies, maps, tablets. And apparently, this is really just one story. Already a year of full-scale war. What are your main conclusions from this year? Main conclusions. First, I believe that Russia has already lost this war. And we haven't defeated it yet. And the main conclusion is that everything depends specifically on us. And if someone is going to watch it, then I want to address this person. Everything depends specifically on you, on me, on my friends. Everything depends specifically on us. No one will delay here, only us. And when we win, I believe it will be. The question is just how long. And by the way, this is the main conclusion, that it all depends on us. How quickly it will happen, and we will return to normal life. And everyone contributes. Everyone can. Of course, the best thing, I think, is to go to the ranks of the armed forces and make your own efforts here, but you can also help financially. It's just what and who likes more. Some donating on bulletproof vests, some on drones. This is probably the first such global conclusion. The second global conclusion of this war. Well, that's what I learned about the war. The fact that war is very similar to civilian life in a section. And here, too, one must be very proactive in order to succeed. And this success can be achieved here. What other conclusions do I have about this campaign? I saw different people, the good ones and bad ones, understood more about human nature. You know it is true that people in war are like naked, and it is very difficult to hide. If in civilian life you can communicate for years and not know who it is, but here you spoke, shook hands, and after a few hours, well, a day at the most, you understand who it is and what it's about. Also, probably, that's the conclusion. The main conclusion is that everything is in our hands, and we will win. Ukraine will definitely win, especially with such powerful defense forces of our country. Mykola, thank you very much for the interview, for finding time to talk, and of course to all our soldiers, and you for what you do for our victory.